Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alana Cooper. I direct the Lifelong Learning Program here at Case Western Reserve University. I'm thrilled this evening to have with us author, Israeli author, Eshkol Nevo, who just got here from Israel this morning. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him in a moment or two. Before I introduce him, I just want to acknowledge that this lecture here this evening is made possible by a number of institutions and organizations working together to bring Eshkol Nevo here. So first of all, his visit is generously supported by the Herbert and Mariana Luxembourg Siegel College Lecture Fund. And in addition, his visit here is sponsored by the Israel Arts Connection of the Jewish Federation of Cleveland. And we're thankful for that cooperative effort. Also important to note that this is our annual, I believe this is our second or third? Third, um, someone help me, second annual um, lecture at Neely Adler Memorial Lecture. And with this lecture, we're really honoring third. I'm getting third. Sorry, I'm new, so you have to forgive me. Um, I'm getting third. But with the lecture, we're really honoring the legacy of Neely Adler, who was so passionate about bringing Hebrew here to this community, making it a lively, spoken, studied language. And we really honor her memory by bringing um, important authors, Israeli authors, here to Cleveland. And I also want to take note, while we're remembering Neely, that the, um, the Beth Elda Heights Synagogue is in the midst of organizing a celebration of Moshe Adler's life of work with them. They are organizing a um, scholar in residence program that will be held here at Siegel on Thursday, June 16th. And they're bringing in the scholar Rabbi Rachel Berkowitz from Israel, whose grandfather was one of Rabbi Adler's very important influential teachers. And I believe everyone has those announcements on the, the flyer for that on their seats. So please take a look and let me know if you need any more information. I can direct you to the right people. In terms of upcoming programs, I want to draw your attention to two things. One is on April 11th, thinking about Pesach coming up, we have the Friends of Jewish Lifelong Learning are sponsoring and organizing a lecture, a lunch and learn lecture and discussion facilitated by Susan Tishkoff and Sue Arnold about Haggadot, the many ways Jews tell the story of Pesach. And they're encouraging people who attend to bring their own Haggadot so that you can look at them together. And I'll also announce my own lecture, which is coming up as part of Eastside Conversation series. I see our own Helga Miller, who organizes the series, nodding in the front. I'll be speaking on Not Your Parents' Jewish Family, Redefining Relationships in the 21st Century. And I hope to see many of you there. With that, I want to introduce our speaker and our guest, Eshkol Nevo. Eshkol Nevo was born in Jerusalem in 1971, and he got his start studying copywriting at the Tirza Granot School and psychology at Tel Aviv University. Today, Eshkol owns and co-manages the largest private creative writing school in Israel, and he's considered to be the mentor of many up-and-coming young Israeli writers. He's published novels, short stories, and nonfiction, his novels have been bestsellers in Israel, and in addition, they've been very successful, translated into many languages, and read by both uh, English-speaking writers as well as, I just found out, speaking to Eshkol before, Spanish-speaking uh, writers and many other languages as well. He's run, won numerous prizes for his work, including Book Publishers Association's Gold and Platinum Prizes, the FFI Raymond Wallier Prize in Paris in 2008, the ADEI Wietzo Prize in Italy, the Stymatsky Prize twice, one for his novel Neuland and one for his novel The Lost Solos, 
Um, he's won the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize in the UK, the Critker's Price de Jury. Sorry, I'm going to butcher this name, but a big prize in Austria in 2011. And um, I should also say that his um, novel Neuland was included in the Independent List of Books of the Year in translation. And once you hear him speak, I know that many of you are going to want to pick up some of his books in English translation we have in the back, in the original Hebrew in the back as well. Please afterwards visit our bookseller table and I'm sure Eshkol Nevo will, um, well, will sign for you as well. So with that, I want to welcome you, Eshkol, and ask all of you to give him a warm Cleveland welcome. Good evening. Happy to be here in Cleveland. Uh, I thought, when I was coming here, I thought that this is a new territory for me. I don't know nobody. But in the five minutes I've been standing there, I have met an ex-student of mine, people who know my parents, people who know my grandfather, and someone I met in Tel Aviv a year ago. So I feel very at home. And I want to uh, begin our conversation with a poem by an American poet called Robert Frost. And the poem is The Road Not Taken. And always when I come to talk with Jewish communities, I think about this poem. For those of you who don't know the poem, it talks about someone who is standing in the woods and he has to decide which way to go. There are two roads, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And they seem quite similar, the roads, but he has to choose. So he chooses the road less traveled by. But then, says the poem, he keeps on thinking about the road not taken. The road not taken is the name of the poem. And whenever I meet with Jewish communities, whether it's in Israel or whether it's here, I think about the road not taken because you are, in a way, my road not taken. I am your road not taken. And I, half of my family, the, my family is rooted in Eastern Europe, uh, and half of it went to America, and half of it went to Israel. So whenever I'm here, I feel that I'm walking in the road not taken. And actually, the road not taken is a central theme in the book I'm going to talk about, which is Neuland, uh, the last book of mine which was translated into English. I take into consideration that most of you haven't read the book. It's OK. Uh, I, will, I will get you in the book and tell you about it and tell you uh, about the stories behind the book. I really like questions, so feel free to ask questions. And I'll, at some point, I will just stop and we'll open up for a Q&A, which is actually what I really like about this kind of meetings. Um, I, I will start by telling you how, or, or by answering the question, how, where did you get the idea for the book? Uh, it's a special story when it comes to Neuland, because it starts in Guatemala. So I have to take you to Guatemala. And in Guatemala, there's a, a beautiful city called Antigua. Antigua de Guatemala. Uh, colorful houses, uh, the, the ancient capital of, of the Maya culture. And I was backpacking uh, there. And there is a, a thing called in, in Antigua, Casa de Familia. Casa de Familia, the house of the family. You can join a local family for a week and actually live with them, uh, which is the idea behind it is to stop being a, a tourist and really experiencing life through their eyes. And the family speaks only Spanish. So if you want to survive this week, you have to improve your Spanish. And I, I'm, I'm a Spanish lover. 
I, I, I really adore this language. So I thought to myself, it's a good idea. I'll get into to this Casa de Familia. Maybe I'll take a, a couple of private lessons in the, in the afternoon. And it's a commitment. You commit to be uh, for a week with this local family. And besides me, in this Casa de Familia, there was another gringo, another tourist. He was a, a, a Canadian man, about, I would say, about 65. And we were introduced at the beginning. And the minute I saw him, I felt, I sensed, there is a story here. I'm, I'm a story hunter. Sometimes I smell a story. So I smell the story. I, I felt that I should do a double click on this person. I should find out. Uh, if, if I, in retrospective, if I would have to say what was it, I think there were two elements. One was his age. It was not that common back then. I'm talking about year 2000. It was not that common to see uh, 65 years old backpackers. But it was not only that. He was sad. Most people who travel, who backpack, even if they're not happy, they would pretend to be happy. Because they paid. They were supposed to enjoy. And this guy, this Canadian man, he was not uh, ashamed of his sadness. He was wearing it like, like a sweatshirt. So I thought to myself, there has to be a story that explains this. Why is he backpacking now at his age? And why is he sad? So I, I, I approached him at the first hour of the Casa de Familia, and I asked him in, in a very kind of open Israeli way, I asked him, excuse me, sir, what brought you here? Then he looked at me, and he said, I decided to speak only Spanish this week. So I cannot answer you in English. I can only answer you in Spanish. Now, till this day, I don't know whether he was just politely telling me it's none of my business, or he was telling the truth. Anyway, I, I didn't know enough Spanish to have this kind of conversation, so I didn't have this conversation, and instead, I was looking at him. We were spending uh, a week together. The place was much smaller than this place. It was, uh, I would say, one quarter of this, uh, this large place we're in. And there was three rooms. There was a grocery store in front of the house. There was a shower outside. And we were together at the same space, and I was looking at him and inventing stories. The same way I, I did as a child when I was riding the bus in Haifa from uh, the city center to my house. I, I was looking at people and inventing stories. So I had four different narratives explaining, by the end of the week, explaining why is this Canadian man backpacking now and why is he sad. So the week ends, and it's the last day of the Casa de Familia. I decided I am going to confront him and to find out which one of my four narratives is the right one. I woke up 7 a.m. With, with a very strong decision to do this, but it turned out that he woke up before me, and he left. And I never saw the guy. Um, the book was published in, in Canada two years ago, so I, while going to Canada, I had a fantasy that I will tell this story, and at this point in time, someone would call from the back row, yeah, that's me. <laughs> it didn't happen. And I, di I didn't see this guy. I haven't seen, he didn't meet, he doesn't know he was the inspiration for the book. The thing is, the thing was that I, I kept on thinking about him. You meet a lot of people when you backpack or when you travel. Some of them you forget after a couple of minutes. But this man, he bugged me. I, I was worried about him in a way. He seemed uh, that he could get lost. So I kept on thinking about him when I came back to Israel. And at one stage, it turned into a story. I turned him into an Israeli, because I don't know nothing about Canadians. So he, he turned 
and to be a, an Israeli uh, widower, 65 years old, going backpacking in South America, getting lost, and his son has to look for him, which is uh, kind of the opposite of what happens usually. Usually, who gets lost in South America? Young people, and their parents go to look for them. So I thought it could be interesting to switch the roles. Let the old people get lost, and, 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 and my generation, their sons, look for them. Now, this was the beginning of the novel. This, this was my, my starting point. And, and this is ex exceptional. Usually, I don't know the endings of my books. But in the case of Neuland, I knew the ending. And it's also connected to something that happened in this Casa de Familia. Because after the Canadian man left, we sat down uh, for last breakfast, the family and me. And the woman asked me if the fact that I'm from Israel means that I'm also from Jerusalem, which is Jerusalem. And I, I said, yes, I was born in Jerusalem. And she, she asked me, is it true that in Jerusalem you have a wall in which you can put pieces of paper and with wishes, uh, requests from God? I heard about it. And I said, yes, it's the Western Wall, the Waiting Wall. And then she asked me, would I be kind enough to take uh, a piece of paper from her and put it in the Western Wall? And I said, of course, you have been, I've been your guest for a week. Let's do it. And she, she tore a piece of paper. She wrote down her, her wish, and she gave it to me. And I put it, I don't know if you remember, back, it, I'm talking about 15 years ago, there was this thing called a pouch, ugly kind of, they don't have these anymore. So I put it in the pouch, and then I, 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 saw, I, I decided it's not safe enough, so I, it went into my, my bag, and then I traveled with it, and then I came back to Israel, and it was in my parents' house in Haifa, and then I moved to an apartment in Tel Aviv with a girlfriend, so it moved with me. Then we broke up. I went to live with my, grand, my grandmother, so it went to Holon, and then uh, after three months with my grandmother, a lot of Polish food, uh, it was too much, so I had to move to another apartment, and then this, this piece of paper was moving with me for about a year, a year and a half, and I, I started thinking about it as a curse. Like, I don't know if you remember the, the chain letters you had. So if you won't pass it on, you will be ran by a train. Uh, so I, I thought, until I go to the Western Wall and put this piece of paper, my life will, be, will, be, will not be corrected. I ended up going to Jerusalem with this, this piece of paper given to me in Guatemala. And while I was doing this, while I was putting the piece of paper in the wall, I thought to myself, this is the ending of the book. The book will end like this. The guy who is looking for his father in South America would come back to Israel, and the ending scene of the book would be him putting the piece of paper in the wall, the end. Now, I knew the beginning, I knew the end, just one, one slight problem, <laughs> I had to find out what happens in the middle. And, and then, and this took me about, I would say, seven or eight years of drafts and redrafts and uh, trying to find the right tone to tell this story. I will read a, a short piece from the beginning of the book. It's the night, uh, the description of the night when Dori is going out from Israel. He's about to leave to look for his father. Uh, I just left Israel uh, 24 hours ago, so it seems very, very relevant. He moves from Neta's room into the light and takes out of his pocket the list Ronnie prepared for him in her neat handwriting. He's crossed out all the items that are already packed in his suitcase or his hand luggage. 
but he still has the feeling that something is missing. He rechecks the usual suspects. Passport, ticket, vaccination card, sunglasses, history book, the set of pictures of his father. Then he goes into the bedroom and finds Ronnie completely buried under her blankets, only a single curl visible. When they slept together the first few times in their apartment in Nachlaot, he was afraid that she'd suffocate and he'd uncover her face when she'd fallen asleep. With time, it didn't worry him anymore. He traces the lock of hair with his finger till he reaches her head, and then Ronnie turns to him, reaches out and pulls him to her for a hug that surprises him. For the whole of the last week, she'd seemed to be anxious for him to leave. She spent the evenings locked in her study, claiming that those emails just create more and more work, and once, when he tried to touch her under cover of darkness after they turned off their reading lamps, her body tensed and shrank back. Take care of yourself there, she says now. Her eyes are still closed, and he wonders whether she's really half asleep or whether she's pretending, avoiding meeting his eyes as she's been doing all week, maybe even all year. Take care of Netta, he says, and covers her again, thinking, I'm really going. It's really happening. Then he takes off his wedding ring and puts it on the dresser, because where he's going, you don't walk around flashing gold jewelry. Then goes back and turns off the lights, exception, except in the bedroom, in the bathroom. Netta screams if they don't leave it on. He takes in his last breath of the house, Again thinking, what did I forget? What did I forget? What did I forget? Damn it. Then double locks the door and leaves the key in the fuse box next to the dead cockroach that has been lying there on its back for a month because no one has removed it. Night air enters his nostrils but quickly turns into the cigarette smoke being exhaled by the driver who offers to put his suitcase into the car for him. The driver looks about his father's age, so Dory does it himself, then gets into the back seat and drops his hand luggage next to him. So, catching a flight, are we? The driver asks. Yes, Dory says, briefly, curtly, as matter of fact as possible. Business or pleasure? The driver continues his interrogation. Neither, Dory admits. So this is the beginning of the book. Uh, I thought of writing a very clear kind of narrative-driven novel about a guy looking for his father, and, and I knew that I wanted him to meet a woman on this journey, a woman that would shake his life in a way, that will make him look in a different way at his own family life, at his own couplehood. But then, when I started thinking about this woman, I had to find an excuse to bring her to South America. I knew they are going to meet in South America while he's searching, but I didn't know what was she doing there. She was about, she's about 30, her name is Inbal, and I had to find a way, I had to find a journey for her. So I started writing short pieces about Inbal just for self-usage, just to explain to myself what is she doing, who is she, why, why, is he, why is she backpacking. And then, strangely enough, I found out that I, I'm enjoying more when I'm writing about her than I'm writing about Dory. And then her pieces got longer and longer and longer, and suddenly I found out that I'm writing Two narratives in this book. One is the story of Dory looking for his father in South America, and the other is the story of Inbal going to visit her mother in Berlin. Her mother is an Israeli, uh, living in Berlin. There are a lot of Israelis now uh, living in Berlin. I just met a group of them two weeks ago. It's amazing. There are like 20, 30,000 Israelis living in Berlin. So her mother is living there, and she's visiting her, and, and there is a wound in this family. The relationship are, uh, is quite loaded and tense. 
And something happens during this visit in Berlin, and then Inbal decided, decides not to come back to her boyfriend, not to come back to her work, quit everything, and go to South America. So I had two narratives, which is complicated enough. Dori and Inbal, but then something else happened. Inbal's grandma called her, and they had a telephone a conversation in the book, and the grandma was amazing. I, I loved her. I loved her Hebrew. I loved the tone that the music of her speech that suddenly changed the music of the book. I love the fact that I have someone in, that comes from a different generation. So I said to myself, I have to get this grandma in the book. She has to be a main character. But then I had to answer the question, what is her journey? Because it's a journey book. We have Dori in a journey. We have Inbar in a journey. If I want Grandma Lily, that's her name, if I want Grandma Lily in the book, I have to find a journey for her. I ended up uh, giving Grandma Lily the journey of my own grandmother. The book, by the way, is dedicated to my grandmother. Uh, the dedication is for my grandmother, Pracha Frischberg. 1916-2010. If she hadn't made the journey from there, I wouldn't be here. By the way, the book was published in, in Poland uh, two years ago, and it was one of the most emotional book tours I ever had, because I was in Warsaw, in the place she was born, talking about this book, which is dedicated to her, trying to find the house that she lived in, which is impossible because Warsaw is ruined, you can't find anything, and still going to the neighborhood and trying to imagine her life. Um, and anyway, I wrote about her story, her journey, and her journey began when she was 17 um, in Warsaw, 1939, a group of young Jewish and uh, Polish, Polish Jewish, went out of Warsaw in a train to Romania, and then from Romania in a boat, in a, in a ship called Tiger Hill. The ship was supposed to travel for a week or two to Israel, to Palestine. It, didn't, it ended up spending a, a month and a half wandering in the seas and harbors, being shot at, being deported. Uh, it was a very, very long journey. And they got to Israel, to the shores of Tel Aviv, at the 1st of September, 1939, which is the first day of World War II. So this is considered the last immigration uh, boat coming to Israel before the war. Uh, so my mother is not a Holocaust survivor. She's an almost Holocaust survivor. And this is, was actually a story she never talked about. Uh, she told us a lot about her childhood and about her first days in the kibbutz and why she left the kibbutz. There was a big fight there. She always talked about my father and how charming and wonderful he was as a child. She never really talked about this journey. And the tragedy was that when I decided to write about it, she was already too old to remember. She was not remembering a lot. She was really trying to remember for me because she wanted to help me, but she couldn't. So I ended up researching and trying to find evidence or journals of people who were with my grandmother on the boat, on, on this Tiger Hill. Um, it was not easy. It was not easy. There's not a lot of, not a lot of people living. Uh, so I went through archives, from archive to archive, ended up in the Haganah archive in Tel Aviv. And they opened up this file for me. And in the file, there were journals of people who were on the boat with my grandmother. And I was trying, this is part of the work of a writer. I was trying to bring myself to a point in which I could imagine what was it to be on a Sfinat Ma'apilim, on an immigration ship. Was it, what was it really, not on the historical level or the formal level? What was day-to-day -day life in these, these ships? For instance, I was interested in the question, were they, 
Were there love stories? Because I wanted to give Grandma Lily in the book a love story on the boat. So I, I thought to myself, it's a tiny boat, 800 people. Is, uh, were there love stories or not? What do you think? Sure. Uh, so I was looking in these journals, trying to find out love stories. And the most fascinating, the most uh, amusing one was, uh, it was a journal of uh, a, a young man. He was, they were all youth movements, Jewish youth movements. They had different groups on this boat. And he was coming from a group of Beital youth movement. And he fell in love with someone from the Shomer Atzair. And I think from your laughter, I don't have to explain how problematic politically this is. So in his journal, he is like two or three weeks, he is reflecting on the question, is it politically OK if he makes a pass, <laughs> if, he, if he starts talking with her? And then, and then, and then one, one more week, he, uh, he, he thinks, what would be the right way to approach her? And you know, reading this in the 21st century, when people are, are sending text messages to each other, like, are you awake? Uh, as, as a way of, of creating, a, of starting over. Uh, it was very funny to read it. And, and eventually, he approached her. She was okay with it politically. They ended up together, and, and there were there were quite there were descriptions of how to find intimate spots within a, 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 an immigration ship that has 800 people on it. So after I read this, I felt confident enough. I can I can write about this uh, uh, immigration ship. I think I will read a short piece. Uh, later, uh, earlier in our conversation in the, in the restaurant with Ilana, we talked about uh, the connection between autobiographical and, and fiction. Uh, and actually, this book eventually doesn't include a lot of real things that really happened uh, in my life or in the, the life of my family. But the piece I'm going to read now is a real story. It's, it's a story that my, my own grandma would tell Every Passover, Passover is now, so is soon happening. And in Lela Seder, we have this tradition in my family of telling Sipurei Etziat Mitzrayim. Like the stories of getting out of Egypt, which can be getting out of Egypt, but could also be getting out of Europe or getting out of the Syrian uh, uh, jail. So this is the story um, my grandma used to tell us a lot. Grandma Lily. Her father, wearing a karakul hat, escorted her to the hotel where all the, the members of the Chalutz youth group had assembled and left her at the foot of the stairs. I'll stay here until it gets dark, he said. Come outside again if you can. But Papa, she protested, only if you can, he hushed her. And if not, that's all right too. We'll meet again. In a few months, in Eretz soil, anyway, won't we? And for that, I'll never forgive myself, she always says. The pain that story brings her has not dulled with the years. On the contrary, it has only grown sharper. My father stood outside, she says, holding the ass without drinking a drop from it. And standing outside there is not like it's here. There it's cold at night. There the rain is angry even in summer. I'm not sure he even had an umbrella. But he stood there and waited for me, just for the chance that he might see me again. But you couldn't know, Grandma. No one knew then that Bar always tries to convince her. It doesn't matter, she says, refusing to make it easier for herself. I went into that hotel and met up with all the other Chalutz members. We drank and danced and laughed, and I forgot that my father was waiting for me outside. The next day, we got on the train that took us to the port, and I never saw my father again. She tells that story at every Passover seder, 
an aunt Nira, who isn't really an aunt at all, but grandpa's unmarried sister, talks about her escape from a British prison. And Uncle Simon tells about the great day on which he was liberated from a Syrian prison camp in the deal that was struck after the Yom Kippur War. Only she, almost despite herself, has to ruin the happy mood of those family stories of the exodus from Egypt, with the story about her father who waited in vain outside the hotel in that Karakul hat. In his last letter for her, in his last letter to her, before the letters stopped coming altogether, he described how some things, how some fags yanked it off his head in the middle of Warsaw and didn't give it back. When she finishes the story, the emptiness of the prophet Elias' chair seems more present, and someone always begins to sing in an effort to lighten the oppressive atmosphere. And everyone joins in, shouting with the raspy voices of people drunk on grape juice. Only she remains silent, her thoughts wandering to that journey. So three different journeys in this book, Dory, Inbal, and Grandma Lily. And I don't want to ruin your joy of reading, but I could say that they all end up in Argentina. In Argentina, Dory will find out what happened with his father. Inbal will, will solve the riddle of the wandering Jew. She, from the moment she comes to South America, she sees writing on walls, the wandering Jew was here, the wandering Jew was there, and she, she is decisive on finding out who is this wandering Jew, and why is he writing these descriptions. And why Argentina? And, and now I'm coming back to the road not taken, which I, the point that I started my talk with. Uh, in a way, Argentina is the road not taken of Zionism. It's not, a, it's not a story many people talk about or know about, or it's not taught in high schools in Israel, but besides Palestine, there was only one place in which someone tried to create a territory, an autonomic territory for Jewish people, and this is Argentina, the Baron, the Baron Hirsch, end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, bought a huge land in Argentina and called all the Eastern Europe Jews to run away from the pogroms and come to live in Argentina. Now, when you read Herzl, and I had to read Herzl because the book is called Neuland, so you can assume that it is referring to Alt Neuland. So I went back reading Herzl, and it's fascinating to discover that he was not Thinking about, usually when, when in, in, in Israeli high school, they teach us that the other option was Uganda. But it's not true. When you read him, you discover that the, big, the real dilemma, the real conflict was between Argentina and Palestine. And he has a, a, a very clear and, and cold uh, discussion within his book, within A State for the Jews, in which he, he, he det in, in details, he says why Argentina is better, in a way, but he has no choice but choosing Palestine. So one of the, thing, the things that this book is asking is what would have happened if state of the Jews would have been formed in Argentina instead of Palestine, and after the army, young Jewish people from the Jewish state in Argentina would backpack in Palestine. Um, and I, I think that's, uh, I have to stop here, or else I will ruin your joy of reading. Uh, so let's, let's open up for a discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks. I'll uh, walk around, take questions with the mic. Who wants to open? You can ask uh, whatever you like. You can ask about the book, about life in Israel. Uh, someone asked me before I, I started, why am I so tanned? Uh, so yeah, I just the last thing I did before going to the airport was going to the beach. 
and now it's snowing here. So feel free to ask whatever you like. I know that my mother was always afraid that when she would ride on the subway in New York that somebody would rip her gold chains off her neck. But I, I find it hard to believe that um, in Argentina that a wedding band would be a similar um, thing that somebody would steal. Is that more that it's saying goodbye to his marriage, that he's leaving the ring behind because that whole life is going to change? once he gets there, or am I reading too much into the, the wedding band staying behind? Ah, it's a beautiful question. Uh, on a practical level, he's going to Ecuador. From Ecuador, he will travel to Peru and to Bolivia. There are certain areas in Bolivia, and also I would say certain areas in, in the capital of, uh, of Ecuador, in which is, it is dangerous to walk with jewelry. Um, it can get violent in certain parts of South America. Depends on the time, depends on the luck. Uh, two days before, I, I had to go f to, to, for investigation. I was traveling in South America myself a couple of times, but when I realized I'm writing a book about a journey in South America, I knew that I had to go there again. And I went for a week in Argentina and a week in Bolivia. And two days before I went to this uh, journey, uh, an Israeli backpacker was, uh, was kidnapped and, and they forced him to, get, to go with his credit card to a machine and to take out money and then they just they shot him. He didn't, he didn't die in the end, but this, it can get dangerous. Uh, and so I love this continent. Don't get me wrong. It's my, other, it's my home outside of home. I come again and again back to Latin America. I love Spanish. Every professional excuse that I have to go there, I use. But it can, it's, it's a beautiful, people are amazing, but it can, it can get rusty sometimes. So he, he has a reason to be warned. And of course, you are right. Uh, it also, it's also metaphor, metaphorical. Uh, the fact that he takes off the wedding ring is, is also a kind of a prophecy. Of course, it's much more complicated than that but uh, you will have to read the book to discover. Thank you for the question. I'll ask a question. Yeah. I'm waiting for hands, so I'll ask one in the meantime, and then I'll get you, bud. Um, I want to ask you about homesick and the relationship um, between homesick and Neuland. Just it struck me when you were speaking how your um, first novel, Homesick, is so much based around the question of home. How do you make a home for yourself? Um, how do you relate to home? What happens when you want to escape home, but you s kind of stick around? And this book, Neuland, is a book about journeys. And I sort of wonder about your relationship. Did you intentionally sort of have one so home-focused and one going out-focused? And part of my question is, um, in the novel, Homeland, uh, Homesick, you have your main character is getting letters from his friend who's on a journey. And there's sort of, he's, he's inviting his friend in Israel to kind of come with me, but his friend in Israel stays put. And I just wonder if you are sort of getting something else out with the, with the journeys in Neuland. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, you mentioned Homesick, so um, it was my first novel, uh, and my first novel translated to English. It's a book that changed my life in a way, um, but when you look at narrative level, yes, this is a book happening in homes in a small place in, in near Jerusalem called Maoz Zion, on the way to Jerusalem, and there are four different houses. It's called in Hebrew, it's called Arba Abatim Vegagua, four houses and, and homesickness, I would say. So, so everything happens in 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 a, in a kind of a homey atmosphere, and there are different kind of relationship between the families in this very tiny neighborhood, and it's about Israeli society from within. The conflicts that you have in these houses are kind of a reflection of the conflicts that you have in the country. But, and, and if you look at Neuland narrative-wise, yeah, it's, most of it is happening in South America, but in a way, it's also talking about the same question, in, in what way 
Israel is a home for its citizens. Uh, who feels at home? How do you feel when you go outside of Israel and you look at it from away? What kind of perspective? For me, Neuland is a book about perspective. How does your perspective change on a personal level and on a national level? On a pers you, you go for a week. You're uh, thrown out of your life. I'm now in a book tour. Okay? I'm out of my life. And immediately, in just 24 hours, immediately you suddenly see things differently, clearly, or you, at least you get an angle. So Neuland is, is about people getting out of Israel, but they're, they're, they're constant, constantly homesick, critical. They suddenly understand what is impossible about their country and what is lovable. Why are they Israelis and why they could not imagine themselves living in another place, but why, what is wrong with the place at the same breath? So Neuland, in a way, is a book that was deeply influenced by my book tours because beginning, starting from 2007, I, I, at least you know, six, seven times a year, I get outside of my life, I get out of the country, suddenly I get asked a lot of questions about, political questions about Israel, wherever I go. You get a different perspective. And in a deep level, this is what this book is about. Uh, you mentioned the Israeli backpacker in Homesick. Yes, he's, he has a different perspective. He is traveling, so he sees these things a bit differently. And, and the same thing is happening with Neuland. Uh, while Dori and Inbar are traveling, Grandma Lily stays put. She believes that it was so hard to create a territory for the Jewish people that nobody should travel. <laughs> she doesn't believe in traveling. It's, it's, it's actually, you know, my grandmother. Every time I would go, she would ask, but why? <laughs> why? Why do you need it? Why, why, why is it so important? Are you sure that you have to go? Is it safe there? Uh, I, would always, I would send her postcards uh, from, from every place. And, and she didn't understand the whole concept of, of, of traveling was, for her was un, 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 unnecessary. So I tried to get different perspective. But, uh, but the question of home, of the question of where is home, what does it mean for a, for a person, is, is the question that I'm asking not only in these two books, I guess, in all my books, in a way. My newest book in Hebrew is called uh, Three Floors, which is, again, something connected to real estate. <laughs> uh, so I guess it's one of the issues that I'm fascinated about. Thank you. You keep answering my questions before I can ask them, which is, I tip my hat to you. That's an old expression. Um, but you raised another issue there. In traveling and in this book, which I confess I have not yet read, are you always looking back at Israel? Is that the focus? That's what you just were speaking of. Mm. Um, if I went to... Guatemala, Argentina, Bolivia, whatever, I've never been there. I would look at that country. But you're talking about traveling and always looking back at Israel. Hmm. First of all, I have to say it's such a, it's such a corrective experience to be here. I've been, I've been, two weeks ago, I've been book touring in Germany. And the Germans, they have this tremendous respect to a writer. They're so respectful, they don't ask questions. <laughs> full of awe. Uh, so so it's, it's really, really, uh, and I'm thrilled to have a, a conversation here. Uh, I think it happens in two levels. Uh, on one level, yes, you exp I'm, in, you know, I'm in Cleveland right now. I'm fascinated by this place. I want to understand where is downtown. Uh, when is this called spring? <laughs> <laughs> Could it be that I, you know, the taxi driver that took me here, she told me that she never went out of the state. Not the country, the state. Are there many people that live in the United States or live here in the Northeast that they, they, they don't go out of their own, 
there's their safety zone. So I'm basically I'm you know I'm fascinated by the place I'm visiting, and it's it's it, wherever it is. But on a, on a different level, there's always some kind of comparison going on, some kind of question that you're having within yourself. Could I could I live here? Uh, would it be a good life for me, living in a peaceful place, no army, no wars, but no friends, uh, no Hebrew, no son? <laughs> uh, so there's always, there's always this kind of in, in, internal discussion happening, and the more, the, the more I like the place, the, the more intriguing it is. Uh, take, for instance, Berlin. It's also connected to, book, to, to the book because in Bach is in Berlin. Berlin is such a multi-layered place for me. My grandmother would not go to Berlin. She would not buy German products. And when my father went working in Germany in the, in the 80s, we, at the beginning we were, we were supposed to hide from her the fact that he is going there. That it, 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 she ended up discovering it. But... but she never went there, and she, she thought, even the thought of visiting Germany was impossible for her. So I get to Berlin, first time I was there with a book at 2007, and I have this multi-layered experience of, on one hand, I'm hearing German around me. You know, specific words in German can immediately make the historical associations. The minute you hear the word raus, for instance. You hear the Judenraus immediately. So this is one layer of, of, of language. And I have my grandmother uh, speaking with me all the time, saying, what are you doing in Germany? And I, and I am also having the time of my life in Berlin, because it's an amazing city. And I'm meeting a lot of Israelis who are not only visiting there, they're actually living there, and they're not planning on going back. So, and, and it seems like they're having fun. And it's cheaper. The rent is cheap. They bought an amazing apartment, which costs half the price. I bought my tiny apartment in Tel Aviv. So it makes you wonder. Now, this, it all happens in, at, at all, all sorts of levels. And I guess it also happens for... for I, I was meeting with uh, Birthright. Uh, do you get Birthright uh, young people going here to Birthright? So I was meeting with Birthright people last summer. Uh, I had this series of, of meeting with, with uh, groups from Birthright. So I, I, out of curiosity, I ended up asking them, doing this quick survey, after 10 days. They, they, they usually met me after 8, 9, 10 days. I was one of their last activities. So they had a little bit of perspective. So I asked them, which one of you would, could imagine his life, or would have liked, or could consider living here? And the result was amazing. It was 80% of the hands were up. Only 10 days. Now, of course, it's not real life. Birthright is a very constructed experience. They, are, they, are, they, they let them see what they want them to see. And they are, of course, intelligent enough to acknowledge that. But... but but I was amazed by the percent. I was amazed by the fact that people had such a strong experience that it, it immediately raised the question that we are talking about. Could I live here? What does it mean for me? What is, what is it compared to my hometown? Why do I feel here different? So I think, I think it's fascinating, this ambivalence. And, and this is one of the reasons I'm writing about it. I think, by the way, that if you wanted to do an exchange, several people in the room would probably switch lives with you. <laughs> but um, I was fascinated by your, the process you described in writing Neuland. It seems that you laid down some markers, so to speak, in terms of characters and situations. And it seemed to be just inspiration that led you to lay down those markers. But then you got more systematic and sort of did research to connect the markers. It was sort of a puzzle. Is that typical of the way you write? And I don't know anything about writing. Is that, do other writers do it that way? 
It's a very, it's a very you gave a very fine description of, of the way I work because some parts of it are in, very intuitive and unplanned. Usually the beginning is a chaos. In, intentively, I want it to be a chaos because I don't want to know too much about my own book. In this case of Neuland, I knew the beginning of the, and the end, but I had the whole, the whole journey in front of me and I didn't know the stops in the journey. I even didn't know they would end up in Argentina which was a big problem because I was backpacking in a lot of countries in South America but not in Argentina. And then I had to deal with the question, can somebody write about Argentina without being in Argentina? Now there's a myth in Israeli uh, literature about Abraham Yoshua, Aleph Bet Yoshua. He wrote a book called The Return from India without being in India. So I, th I said to myself, if he did it, I can do it. And I tried writing Argentina without being in Argentina using uh, Google Earth and harassing uh, Argentinian immigrants <laughs> in, the, in my town. Uh, and I ended up, it, it took like half a year of writing, and I, I read my own pieces about Argentina and I felt this is false. It's like in music, you, when someone is not finding the right tone. I felt it's, it's, I could feel the guy who wrote these pieces about Argentina doesn't know nothing about Argentina. And so I ended up doing this very uh, planned thing, going on a research to Argentina. I went, I was out to find a specific place, by the way, called Moises Vische, Moisesville. It's an old uh, Baron Hirsch settlement. Uh, it's kind of, a, it's still kind of a combination of a shtetl and, and, uh, and, and a Latin, and, and, and has Latin aspects to it. And I knew I wanted to get there, and I planned it really, really carefully for half a year, uh, including, this, it's a very small town, and there isn't even a bus stop there. So if you, ha if you want to go to, Argentina, to this Moises Vichy, you have to take the plane to Buenos Aires, then a bus from Buenos Aires to another town, and then you have to make an appointment with the only taxi driver, which is in Moises Vichy. Now, it seemed impossible, but we're talking about the Jewish uh, uh, people. So it turned out that I know <laughs> An Argentinian writer, his sister made Aliyah, and when she made Aliyah, he, he asked me to help her. Now, the best friend of this sister, her mother, is a neighbor <laughs> of the only taxi driver in Mosesville. <laughs> so this was very planned, and we made the appointment, and I went this, this, this long ride, and she was actually waiting for me. And then she took me to, it's a two hours ride, and we get to this place, to Moises Vish. And there's no hotel in the, in the small town. There's only a widow who is entertaining the rare guests. Now, I had this kind of imaginations about the widow that I'm going to meet, uh, kind of uh, Zoba the Greek widow. And I ended up meeting, the, 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 the street, by the way, was called State of Israel. Estado Israel 32, State of Israel 32, in the middle of the Pampas in Argentina. And, and the widow was Paula, 94 years old. And she opened the door and she showed me my room. And then it turned out, talking about this, this relationship between planned and unplanned that you asked about, suddenly I realized something that I haven't thought about during the long preparations. In this town, they speak only two languages, Yiddish and Spanish. I don't speak Yiddish. I don't speak Spanish. So how can I do research? Uh, so I tried to explain to Paula the, the situation, the problematic situation. She was giving me knishes to eat. And, 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 she, and I was talking with my hands a lot, and then she understood, 
And then she, she had this kind of phone when you do with your, with your finger, 70s kind of phone. So she did this movement, and she called people, and it turned out there is someone in Moises Vishen that speaks Hebrew. One, Batsheva. And we made an appointment for tomorrow morning, and she showed up, and it turned out that she actually never really spoke Hebrew. She just learned Hebrew. And this, she speaks amazing Hebrew that has never been used. It's a combination of biblical uh, and, 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 and with, with Spanish influence, influence. And this was so amazing that I forgot about the whole research. And I ended up just listening to her wonderful creations in Hebrew. Like, I, it's, it's in Hebrew. I, I, it's like, Noah v'cherpa. Ahava Livnat Kanaf, Sasa Anochi. Instead of uh, saying she wants to make Aliyah, she said, I want to. Erok. Uh, How do you say to Larok? I want to defect to Israel. She was, she was making so, so many funny mistakes. So, she, I, she, uh, so I understood she has to be a character in the book. And there is a character in the book inspired by her called Cecilia Arona speaking in this amazing Hebrew. I think the, the, the translation tried to make it a bit biblical, a biblical kind of pathos. So coming back to your question, the creative process is, is oh, you always move between parts that you are very, very intuitive and parts that you are extremely planned, even mathematical. Suddenly you see at, at some stage, some, in, in a point of time or in the creative writing process, you understand the structure of the book you know where it's going, and then you, you start being very, very planned. Um, yeah. Uh, Eshkol, thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to ask about your insatiable hunger to capture reality. Uh, most uh, authors do away with words, but it seems that it's not enough for you. Uh, you like photos and taking pictures a lot. Uh, and you take great pains to um, portray not only the picture itself, but how it was taken, how it was chosen, what was the reason that that led the photographer to take the picture under these lights and that time and those people in. And sometimes the ideal picture is not there, so you use uh, transplant to, to just symbolize in the picture. And I wanted to ask you about this because I find it fascinating that an author would have half of his book sometimes dedicated to pictures and taking pictures, if you want to talk about this for mm. a second. Actually, I hate pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so satisfied with your question because I was able to trick you. Uh, because he, I think you're asking this because of homesick, because of Noah. Noah is, uh, is one of the main characters in the book. She is learning photography in the Academy of Arts, Bezalel, in Jerusalem. And in the book, there's a lot of her photos. She's trying to make a project about homesickness. And it's happening during uh, the rough time in Jerusalem after uh, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. She's trying to find an artistic way to express reality. Now, in order to write Noah, the same way I had to go to Argentina, I had to get into photography. Uh, but I don't like photos too much, and I don't really know where to press the button when people give me the camera. But while I was writing, I was, I was completely into it. And I found that it's a beautiful way to make the story very concrete, to give a very concrete description. I work with photos, by the way. I'm inspired by photos. One of the last meetings I had in Israel before coming here was with a, a photographer called Nomi Leshem. Which, and we decided to do a project together, that she would take photos and I would write text that will, combine, will be combined. Something about the fact that the photo is still always intrigues me or provokes me to, to do some kind of motion, uh, to, to, in, to imagine the story, what happened before, what happened afterwards. One of the first exercises we give at the creative writing course, which the girl sitting <laughs> near you participated in, is take a picture and write the story behind it. I, I find it very uh, attractive uh, to do it. 
but I don't know a lot about photography. It, 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 it happens again and again. One of my, uh, the book, not my, my newest book, the book before, Lost Solos, has a lot of birds in it. And it's talking about a specific species of bird which I call the lost solos. Birds who have lost their flock. Suddenly you see a bird from South America in Israel, an Israeli bird in Cleveland. So I invented this species called the lost solos with, with, with a lot of like quasi-scientific descriptions. And as a result, people are sure that I'm an ornithologist and they send me text messages from all over the country. I saw this bird and it's a lost solo. Is it a lost solo? Now, there is no species as called the lost solos. I just invented it. So people, uh, that's why I'm happy that you think that I'm into photography. Um, yeah, more questions. Ashkol, thank you very much for all your inspiration. I wanted to ask you, how do you overcome writer's block? Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> wow. Um, actually, uh, I had a big writer's block with both the, the books we're talking about, No Homesick and Neuland. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about Neuland. Um, when the book was I would say one year old, I had already 200 pages. I stopped and I said, wow, I'm spending a lot of time on this project and it, it get, it's getting me into trouble because I'm going to travel to Argentina. And so I have to check, is it at all interesting to anybody besides me? So I gave them the manuscript, which was, I would say it was half of the book. I gave it to three people to read. Two of them were ex-students of mine, the kind of students that when they speak, the whole class is silent, the kind of students that I knew that would not be afraid to, to criticize me, tough kind of students, and to my wife. So I had three people with my half manuscript of Neuland. And the first thing that happened was that they didn't come back to me. That was not very nice. Two weeks, three weeks, a month, month and a half. Now, never mind them, my wife. You know, we're in the same house, and I, I'm, she's not progressing. I'm, I'm, I'm looking. It's near the side of her bed, and I, not, nothing is happening there for days. So I realized there is some kind of problem, and then came the meetings. Okay, They finished eventually. They were able to finish the, the manuscript, or the half the manuscript, and I started meeting with them, and they were very critical. Actually, the students more or less told me, you should reconsider the whole project. <laughs> My wife was generous enough, and also I think uh, uh, thoughtful, and, and she knows my work enough and knows me, she said, look, the book is not working. Something is not working. I cannot explain you what, but I feel it's the right book. You're writing the right book. The heart of it is, is you can feel the heartbeat. The, this book has a heartbeat, but something is not working. So as a result of these uh, reactions, I went into a very long writer's block. I didn't know what to do. The first thing I, you, I, I do when I have a writer's block is, is just put it aside, not fight it. And then I started writing other stuff, short stories, lousy poems, a project with mu musicians. Just forget about it, not, not uh, try to fight with it. And then after three months, I left it aside for three months, and I was traveling, I was in a book tour from, in a, on a train from Switzerland to Germany, and suddenly it came to me. Suddenly I understood. Suddenly I understood what was wrong. I was trying to replicate the, the same structure that Homesick has, because 
it worked so well for me and also big success in Israel, I was trying to take the same structure and copy it to Neuland. And you can't do this. Every book has its own soul, its own rhythm, its own way of telling itself. So the minute I understood this, the, the writing block was over. I, I had to start the book all over again, putting aside 200 pages, starting to write it again, organizing it, organize it differently, changing the voices, changing, making it a journey, and not, uh, and, and, and this, this ended the writing, the writer's block. So if you have a writer's block, don't be afraid, it's natural, it happens, just leave, leave it aside for a while. And, uh, and usually it solves, the problem solves itself, in a way. Yes? This may sound like a political question, but it's not. Uh -huh. It's about homesick. Um, everybody there seemed to have a resolution of some sort at the end. Resolution? Yeah, of what's happening to them. The little boy went to Australia. No one, I forget the name of the guy. I'm here together. But, and, and this is not a political question. <laughs> the Arab guy. I'm not sure how him being in prison, learning Hebrew, was a resolution for his conflict. Of course, it's also not going to be a political answer. <laughs> Just like your question was not a political question. Uh, no, it's not. You're right. It's not a resolution. It's. Um, There, there, let, let's, I, I want to tell also the people who haven't read the book, there are a couple of characters in Homesick. One of the characters is Tzadik. He's a Palestinian construction worker. He's building a house for Jews in this neighborhood of Maosion. While building the house, he suspects that the house in front of him is the house of his childhood, where he was deported from at 48 War, Independence War, or the Nakba, as it is called by the Palestinians. So he goes to his mother and she, he gives her a description of the house and she says, yes, it's the house. You don't remember, you're very small. And not only that, she tells him, I forgot something. I left something behind while we were running away. Could you please bring it to me? So just imagine the scene, a Palestinian construction worker in the middle of the terrorist attacks of 1995, knocks on the door of a Jewish family and says, excuse me, can I dig in your wall and take something that my mother left behind? He ends up in jail, and you're right, it's not a uh, resolution in any way. Uh, it's, in a way, a reflection of Israel's approach to this narrative, of the fact, the amazing fact, that in history, in history lessons, the Palestinian side of the 48th War is not taught at all. Homesick is part of the final, final exam in literature in Israel. Students learn this book, so imagine how confusing it is to, to learn this book, to hear Tzadik telling his story, and then to go to a history lesson and to hear there is no such story. Israel, talking about the Palestinian narrative of, in, of 48 in Israel is a taboo. There, there was even an attempt to make a law in the parliament that if you talk about it or mention it or or, 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 or deal with it, you're, you, you're going to be punished. So, yes, it's, it's a very provocative aspect of the novel. It had a lot of, uh, there was a lot of conversation when the, when the novel was out in Israel. By the way, the fact that the child uh, immigrates to Australia is also not a resolution. Uh, I had a lot of my readers in Israel angry about me. People, by the way, people in Israel are much less polite than you <laughs> in readings. They come to readings to, to complain. Also to, to, uh, to, uh, to say compliments, to compliment. But, but the, the fact that th this family loses their son in Lebanon, the, the, the young child you were talking about, Yotam, he misses his brother, he misses also his parents because his parents are so consumed in griefing, they don't pay attention to him. 
So the fact that they end up immigrating to Australia was, I would say, even shocking to, to, to some of my readers in Israel because it doesn't go well with the narrative. And part of the thing that literature can do is challenge the narrative or challenge the formal uh, narrative. Uh, I had, by the way, two weeks ago an amazing event in, uh, in Hanover in which I have uh, uh, um, Hanover, the Palestinian community and the Jewish community are, are quite close to each other. The leaders are good friends. So they made a joint event to my new book in German. And I had half of the audience Palestinians, half of them Jewish. And I think for the first time in my life. And, and it, was, it was amazing to see the different questions, the different angles, uh, the way it opened up discussion. Uh, even in Hanover, it's very problematic. The two leaders got a lot of criticism for doing this. Not all the community came. They, they dragged the, the conflicts even, even to there. Not all of them were happy that I was there. The Jewish, you know, you know Jewish communities. The Orthodox came, but the, the Reform, Conservative, uh, they call it liberal. The liberal banned the event. Why? You, you know, they didn't like the, They didn't like it. You would have expected it would be the opposite, but it wasn't. No, you know, it wasn't. So, yeah, literature is can be provoking, can be, uh, can create discussions, can can be can make you angry. It's part of the thing I like to do in my books uh, to open up questions, not only you know to give answers. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Could you comment on the national mood and your personal mood as to what is happening today in Israel, particularly with the current terrorist activity? Mm. Um, having a daughter who lives there, mm. uh, you can imagine, of course, what one goes through in terms of not knowing or wondering. I just thought of it, coming to Cleveland, uh, one of the most, one of the funniest, extraordinary, uh, very Israeli things, thing that happened uh, a couple of months ago, uh, just before the, the, this, this terror era, uh, David Blatt got fired from the Cleveland Cavaliers. And the, the amount of anger, <laughs> emotional involvement of Israelis. They were all, you know, watching the, the Cavaliers games in the nights, and then they were all pissed off on LeBron. And, and this, was, this is happening in the country that has bigger issues, okay? And, and, and I think, I think it's, it's an, also an answer to, to, your, to your question, because yes, it's a rough time, but it is always a rough time. This is life in Israel. Is it dangerous? Is your daughter in danger? Not more than any other in any other time in Israel. Um, I, I had a very fascinating correspondence with a publishing house in the United States at the recent, uh, I would say, two or three weeks. They read Three Floors, my new book in Hebrew, and they were commenting on the fact that how could you write about life of Israelis without mentioning the conflict? They were, they were amazed by the fact there is no Palestinian in your book. How could that be? And I had to, it was very funny because I had to actually explain my book. I never explained my books. I had to explain that this is part of Israel, the Israeli psyche. We are living with this conflict for so many years that on one, on one level we got used to it, on the other level we, didn't, we, we, we never get used to it. You never get used to the fact that I, also, you know, my daughter walks to school and we, in my very peaceful town, my Cleveland-like town in Israel, Ranana, 
it suddenly became a terror uh, city in the last half, uh, half a year. So my daughter is afraid. She calls me on her way from the school. She called, I was on the plane. The plane was in Israel, uh, had problems. So I stayed a lot, like two or three hours we were on the plane. So she was calling me in, in the middle of the airplane. I was, my job is to talk with her while she's walking from the school home. It's like a 20 minutes walk. And since, since the terrorist attacks in, in Ranana, she's afraid to walk. But she has to walk because I'm not there to take her. So I'm, we're talking, passing time until she gets home. Um, sounds crazy, but, but this is life uh, in Israel. Uh, Walter, my student here, um, we ha she was participating in a workshop during uh, the war we had uh, a summer ago. Uh, missiles were shot at Tel Aviv. And I remember the first time the missiles were shot. We were on our way to the creative writing, writing workshops. Then there was an alarm. So we stopped the car. We went to hide in a, in a house or in a, in a shelter. And then we, we came to the workshop, which is in a, was in a private house in Tel Aviv. And I was sure, confident, that the people in the workshop would like to cancel it. Okay? They have just gone through a trauma. It is a trauma when missiles are shot at you. So I was preparing myself to cancel the workshop. So we get into the room, 15 people sitting with their notebooks, with their pens, and, and we said, Do you, are you sure you want to go, go through with this? And he says, yeah, sure. We came a long way. We want to do the workshop. And what will happen? We'll have another week. Yeah, we'll go to a shelter. So you remember this? So. This is, in a way, how we live. It's tragic. I don't think we should accept it as a future to our country. I don't think that... I find it hard to accept this kind of desperate um, tone uh, you find, in, in a way, Israelis are sometimes speaking about the future. I feel that we should always crave for a change. You cannot accept. I, I would not like my daughters to live this kind of life. Okay? I would do everything I can to change this, um, to solve the conflict, which is in the base of, of our life, uh, of the tragedy of Israeli life. But this is, this is the situation now. We, we write, we create, we party, we make love, and, and this is happening while, while a very problematic uh, situation is going on, uh, and on and on and on. So I wish your daughter <coughs> safe days in Israel. I'm sure she's having a, an interesting experience. Is she studying there? Is she studying there? 1984. Okay, she, she, she's used to it. It's okay. She's okay. Okay. Can I, can I finish with a couple of lines? It's uh, the finishing lines of homesick, but uh, don't worry if you haven't read the book. It's not the kind of books where you discover in the final page who, who killed, uh, who was the killer. It's only a letter. You mentioned the letters by Modi, an Israeli backpacker. Uh, and this is his final letter from South America to his friend Amir, who is in Maosion. And this letter is made out of promises, the promises that he has made to himself while traveling. Maybe you know this. When you're traveling, you suddenly have many decisions. You want to change your life when you come back. So <coughs> it's kind of a list of promises, of changes. Uh, if you may call it a kind of a, a secular uh, prayer. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole letter, just the ending uh, lines. I'm sick of being stressed out. I want to take my time so I can make my time. I want to work hard, but not like a maniac. The Europeans I met here work four days a week, go home at six, and don't think there's anything wrong with it. 
I want to watch less TV. I haven't watched any for six months. I don't miss it at all. I want to live in the nature. And if that's too complicated, then I want to at least leave Tel Aviv at weekends. I want to stand on the edge of something and see far into the distance over the rainbow. I want to get turned on by little things, walking barefoot on the sand, eating the cone after the ice cream's gone, colorful graffiti on a dirty wall, new music I never heard before, not shaving, shaving after a long time of not shaving and running my hand over my smooth cheek. I want to get turned on by all those little things, not to let them pass me by without noticing them. I want love. For too long now, I've been using my split from Adi as an excuse, and now, after those two weeks with Nina, I know that I don't have to settle for kiss, fuck, we'll talk tomorrow, bye. I want to read more, ride the bike more, get on better with my sister. I want to look people in the eye more, speak the truth more, and besides, I want to go home. Thank you. Eshko will be speaking here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and he'll be speaking in Hebrew tomorrow afternoon here at 4 p.m. Thank you.